Um, anyway, happy Mother's Day once again. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 3 and we'll jump in together today about our passage. You know, in the winter of 1998, I found myself in college in Portland, Oregon. I didn't really know I was going to go to college. In fact, I was planning on going to District 7 Fire Department. I was accepted in the residency program to be a firefighter there, but I received an acceptance letter from then Multnomah Bible College as well, saying that you're accepted to come to school here, and my family encouraged me to do that first. And so, um, especially my grandfather said, I'll help even pay for part of your college if you want to go there. It'd be a good thing to get a college degree. It'll help you all the way down the road. I was pretty ignorant about what Multnomah Bible College was all about, to be honest with you. In fact, I rolled in there my first day on campus I told my professor, who was my advisor, he asked me what I wanted to do at Multnomah Bible College, and I told him, well, I was thinking if you had like a fire science degree, it'd be great to do that. And he looked at me and said, son, do you know what type of college you've come to? I didn't. I didn't have a clue. I thought it was just a Christian college. I thought it was just a great place you could go and learn. But here I was. I also didn't expect soon after that that I'd join a singing group called Destiny. And as I was part of Destiny, the reason why I did this is because I was sitting in the hallway playing in the dorms playing my guitar one day, and some guy came up and said, hey, you can sing at least a little bit. Um, we need some guys to join our singing group. And you get 1200 bucks if you do it. So the singing group didn't appeal to me, but the 1200 bucks appealed to me, right? So I was like, yes, I can do that. So I found myself trying out, singing in Star Spangled Banner for the director, Mrs. Miriam Gibby down there, and made it into the Destiny group. And in the first day that I was there, I was placed in between two gals, and the one on my left was a gal named Kelly Riley. I didn't know Kelly at this time. We got to know she was an upperclassman in my mind. She actually was. She's younger than I am, but she was at college earlier than I was. And so she had gone through. So she was a big sophomore, and I didn't really know what to think of her. But I was like the bachelor to the rapture guy, though. I was like, I didn't want to get married. I didn't want to be in a relationship. I had just come off a fairly good relationship with another girl um, that was kind of long distance. I had been living in Australia for a couple of years. And, and when you're dating someone in Australia who lives in America, it works really well. So um, just so you know, it didn't work out at all. But I'd gone and I just didn't know what to do and I didn't want to be involved in this relationship. And so long story short, we did started doing group things with our Destiny group. And, and one night, our group thought it would be really funny if they set Kelly and I up on a date. And so we all planned, we all planned, I'm serious, we all planned to go to the movies together that night. And all of a sudden, everyone started canceling left and right. But I had borrowed someone's car and I was ready to go. And so Kelly and I were the only two left, except for one other guy named Josh. I won't tell you about him. He didn't hear the news, and he was going to come with us, <laughs> which is a really, really awkward thing. So I think someone called and said, hey, hey, buddy, like, you're not supposed to go to this thing. Just FYI, all right? So, okay, whatever. So Kelly and I decided not to go to the movie because that felt like too much of a date to me. So we ended up at Comedy Sports in downtown Portland and enjoyed that, which is a great, just stomach-busting, fun experience. And then we went to have a mud pie at Red Robin afterwards in downtown Portland. And that, you can say, the rest was history, basically, from there. You know, I remember on a, a date several months later where it was February of 2000, or excuse me, 1999, I guess, where we took a, a long, or 1998, excuse me, we took a long walk um, outside of campus because you weren't allowed to touch while you were on campus. You know, guys and girls weren't, so we had to walk off campus to do anything. And I, I remember at this moment I was doing, that sounds really bad. <laughs> yeah, you can use your imagination. I won't say anything from there. But we, uh, we started walking off campus, and I was trying to gain the courage to tell her this whole thing. I don't remember all the things I said that night, neither does Kelly, but she does remember one thing, and I remember this as well. I was stumbling through my words, blah, 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 but I remember saying one thing really well, and I said, well, it's just, I like you, Kelly Riley. And that was it. And she looked at me, and she's like, oh, that's great. I like you too. Okay, that was so silent for so long. Why did you wait so long? What are you doing? You know, why did you do I was working so hard to tell you this, and that started a special relationship that we have had. We were married in the summer of 99 and have been married for almost 16 years, which is an amazing thing, which is very cool. But the f Yeah, thank you. But the funny thing is, is it took a risk to start that relationship. It took a next step, that I had to take that next step to take the risk, and she did too. She had to say either yes, I want to risk back, or no, I don't want to go there. It took something where I had to take that next step in a relationship to build that with her so that we'd have a special relationship going forward. You know what's funny? 
I think something similar to that happens in Mark chapter 3 today. You wondered how I was going to get there, right? Something really interesting happens in Mark chapter 3. Jesus actually takes a risk on a few of his closest followers, men that are going to be distinct from just the normal crowds and people that are following them, and they are faced with a decision at that moment. How are they going to respond to his calling, to that moment when he says, I want you to follow me? What are they going to do in that moment? Are they going to say, oh, I'm not sure I want to do this? Or are they going to jump in and say, okay, let's take that next step in our relationship to make this official, if you will. Because see, there's two types of people in Mark so far. There's the crowd, or those that are following Jesus from a safe distance, if you will. And then there's disciples. They're the ones who Jesus calls to that next step. And they get to respond to that risk and follow him when he calls to them. So the question we're going to be faced today is this. Do you want to be part of the crowd, or do you want to be one of the disciples? Do you want to take that next step and follow him, to walk with him, to say yes to the calling he's going to have on your life, to kind of have that DTR, to define the relationship with him, what step are you going to take? You might say to me, well, wait a second, aren't aren't these people like the disciples, aren't they like elite people? Aren't they like the creme of the crop, like the most amazing of Christians out there? You you might think that. I have some good news for you, though. The, The only thing special about these men is not their qualifications, It's the one who calls them that actually makes them qualified, and we'll see that in just a second. I want to read a few verses from Mark chapter 3 together, and let's talk about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to accept that risky call and to take the next step in a relationship with Christ today. We see that in Mark 3. Let's read from verse 7 and following. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Verse 13. And he went up to the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And then he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and the brother, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Cananean and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. And then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. We'll stop there for now. Amazing story. Here Jesus has the crowds around him. Jesus is at the pinnacle of popularity in his ministry. He has millions of Twitter followers right now, if you can picture it like that. I noticed this morning that Justin Bieber is one of the most Twitter-followed persons in the world. He has 65, 63 million followers. They say that his Twitter account is worth $21 million. And every time that he tweets something out, someone should pay him 400 and some dollars for the amount of tweets that he has. Amazing picture of marketing. Jesus is at the top of his game right now. Everyone Everyone knows who he is. Everyone's following him from a distance, but not many are getting too close to him. Not many are seeing him up close like the disciples are getting a chance to do. There's people from all over. Jesus' fame is spread and people were curious about him. From Judea, from Jerusalem, way down in the south. Idumea was even further south than Judea. Beyond the Jordan was territory east of the Jordan River. I mean, there were people coming from all over to experience what is happening here. And maybe they're coming with needs. Maybe they're coming to be, have a demon cast out of a friend or a relative or something like that in their, in their lives. But there's another group in the text, too. That's his inner circle. That's the people that he desires to call to himself. He tells them at one point here to get the boat ready for him because the crowd's pressing. And, and then after that moment, he leaves. He goes up to a mountainside, and he spends some time praying. And what does he do in that moment? He takes that, that risk, and he calls out to these 12 apostles and says, Would you come with me? I desire you, is what the Bible says there. I want you to be with me. We cannot pass these verses too quickly. When it says in Mark 3.13, he chose with them those he desired. And they came to him and he appointed 12 to be with him that they might send him out to preach and have authority to cast out the demons is what it says in verses 14 and 15. It's an amazing picture. 
First of all, if you look at this thing, there's a, there's a, a verb here in, in verse 14 when it says, and he appointed. The original Greek word, however, was actually made. It wasn't that he appointed or commissioned or anything like that. It's just the word made. And so it means that Jesus made them his disciples. He actually called them out and created them in that way. It wasn't like they were qualified in some way, shape, or form beforehand. Jesus said, I want to call those men and make them my disciples. I have a job to do with them. And it reminds us just that God is still creating us. He doesn't just take us as we are and do the best he can with what's there. He actually makes us the people we need to be, which is a pretty amazing thing. So, so the risk is on Jesus, not necessarily on you. It, the risk is, is, is on Jesus to take your life, however it is, however messy you might be, however many issues that you come in here with today, and respond to him and say, yes, I want to follow you. And then Jesus can make you his disciple. He can make you in that way. I love that picture. It, makes, it gives me hope, I, I guess. It, I, I see my faults. I see my brokenness at times. I see various things in my life that I say, oh, I'm not quite there yet. And then I read this. Jesus appointed or made whom he desired to be his disciple. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for choosing me because I know how lame I am at times. It's a very cool thing. You know, John 15, 16, Jesus even reminds his disciples right before his arrest that he says these words, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Here in Mark, we see the beginning of that call. So let me just emphasize the thing I said a minute ago once again. Jesus doesn't always call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. Do you know the difference there? You might feel like you have to be an elite Christian in some way, shape, or form to, to follow him, to be in his inner circle, to not just be part of the crowd and follow him from a distance like you're watching on Twitter or something like that, but rather God qualifies you when he calls you if you say yes in that relationship with him. I love that. Who did he call here? Normal, everyday men to follow him, to take his message to the ends of the earth. There's a famous classic work called The Training of the Twelve from the 19th century. It was written by a man named A.B. Bruce. Bruce says something funny. He says, these men were stupid, slow-minded persons, right? Now, that might take it a little bit too far, but they weren't who we'd expect. I mean, let's think about this list of people. Look at these guys. Simon Peter, all right? Simon Peter was the leader of the Twelve, but the man usually had the foot in the mouth disease, right? He kept saying stupid things on a regular basis. He was not known for his, his pause and his reflection as he, before he talked. He was known to say things before he really thought of them. And then, I wish I could bring that back. Oh, man, what am I doing? I wish I could not have said that in that moment. But Jesus gives him a nickname. He says, you're the rock, Peter. You're the rock. Sorry, Wayne Johnson, you're not the first rock. Peter's better. Usually when Jesus called Simon, he was acting like his old self. But when he called him Peter, he was acting like the new self that God was creating him to be. Look in the, in the scriptures sometimes. When Simon's name is used, there's almost code for like, are you acting like your old self? Or are you being the disciple I'm making you into right now? Then you're Peter, the rock. He's the most notable preacher. He's the dominant preacher in the first 12 chapters of Acts. We'll look at his message in just a few minutes here. So let me ask you this. Are, are you a person who speaks first and thinks later. Aren't you glad that Peter's one of the disciples? There's room for you in that way. There, there's, there's hope for you, even if you say dumb things sometimes. There's still hope for you in that way. According to Eusebius, who's a church historian, Peter was so committed to Jesus that he was actually made to watch his wife's crucifixion, and then he followed that with being crucified himself upside down on a cross because he said he wasn't worthy to be crucified in the same way his Lord was. That's the church historian who told us that. Then there's James and John. These are the brothers we met in chapter 1 while they were fishing. Interesting thing about them, half a dozen times in the New Testament, they're identified as the sons of Zebedee, who is simply a fisherman. However, he must have been a unique fisherman. He must have been a popular man, maybe a business owner, because the authors of Scripture keep mentioning Zebedee. But we don't know a lot about Zebedee, but evidently those in their culture did. In fact, we find out that Zebedee is known by the high priest at the end of the Gospel of Mark. We find that out. Jesus gave them a nickname. He called them the Sons of Thunder. The way that we would say this today is these men were hotheads, is what, they would, what we would say. These men had a short fuse, a temper, if you will. They were angry, and Jesus knew that about them. See, the interesting thing is, like, usually anger is kind of a disqualifying thing for most of us, isn't it? People get angry. You think, oh, that person can't possibly be a Christian. And then we see this story. The sons of thunder make it in. 
the sons who are the hotheads make it in. What in the world? Do you know that, that these men were also martyred as well? James was martyred in Acts 12, verse 2, we see. And there's Andrew, who's Peter's brother, also a fisherman. We learn that this guy has a strong faith. At the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6, Andrew's the guy who brings the little boy to Jesus and says, this is all the food we got right now. What are you going to do with it, Jesus? You know, he's, the, he's that guy. He says, what are you going to do? He also wins Peter to follow Jesus. We find out that Andrew is a man with much faith. He thinks that Jesus can do things, and he comes with expectation. We find out that Andrew, under the order of a governor of Acacia, was apparently crucified on an X-shaped cross, exhorting people to trust in Jesus as he died. Pretty amazing story. Philip, uh, along with Andrew, he heard the teachings of John the Baptist and, and then heard the call of Jesus to follow, and he did. We learn that he is the practical guy. So if Andrew's the man of faith, Philip's the man of practical things. In fact, when the feeding of the, same thou- feeding of the 5,000 happened in John 6, right after Andrew brought him to um, this little boy to Jesus and said, here's all the food we got, Philip said, it's going to take 200 denarii to feed all of these people, which is between five and $10,000 today. We don't certainly have enough food to eat. Here's the practical guy. The guy who's like, get down to brass tacks, you know. Let's talk about what's real. I'm, I'm, I'm not into ideas. I'm not into strategies. I'm into execution. That's him. And he's a man who thinks like that. Maybe, maybe that's you. Maybe you're super practical. Maybe the sermons on Sunday morning are a little too airy for you, like too much over your head. Do you, do you know there's a place for you as a disciple of Jesus as well, just like Philip? Philip eventually went on to spread the gospel to Ethiopia. In a beautiful story in Acts chapter 8, he tells of a guy who was serving the queen of Ethiopia and baptizing him. He was super influential in bringing the gospel to that area. Bartholomew. The name is only mentioned in a list of disciples and the gospels in Acts. Tradition says that he actually brought the gospel to India, and it very well could be true. He's the man who is probably also known as Nathaniel in the scriptures. And if this is true, Jesus said something really amazing about this guy when he called him. In fact, he said one word, or he said behold, this word, this phrase, Behold, there's a true Israelite in whom I find no guile. I find no, no flaw in him at all. Uh, Jesus surprises him by kind of supernaturally seeing him while he was praying under a fig tree. And then he did what? He got up and he followed Jesus from that moment. See, the interesting thing about Bartholomew is he's probably the, the really devout guy, the one who gets up every, fi- every morning, like five o'clock, to do his quiet time, and, you know, the guy that makes all the rest of us angry. Like, what are you? I don't feel so spiritual when I'm around you. And here's this guy. Jesus has a place for even the most type A among us as well. Then there's Matthew. We looked at Matthew last week. He's also known as Levi. He's the writer of the Gospel of Matthew, and he's a tax collector. That Jesus would even call a tax collector is one of the most amazing things ever. Moreover, we're pretty sure that he was not rela- raised in a religious family. We're pretty sure that he was one of the, not one of the people who were following John the Baptist or anything like that. In fact, he was called by Jesus when he was sitting in his booth collecting taxes, and he was so compelled by him that he said, yes, I will follow you. Then Thomas, a, an eternal pessimist, as most of us know, is the one who, after the resurrection of Jesus, says, I'm not going to believe in him unless I can see the scars, unless I can see those things, because I don't want to believe these things. So even though he's known to us best as Doubting Thomas, we find out that he eventually declares in John 20, my Lord and my God. His testimony shows us that there's even a place for the skeptics among us in here as well. James, son of Alpha, Alphaeus. This is not the author of James, Jesus' brother. This guy is known as James the Less. We don't know a lot about him. But if he's got a name like James the Less, what kind of baggage might that come with it, right? How would you like to be known as this? But, But that's the point. He takes even those who feel less and makes them important. Interestingly enough, the next guy's even worse. Thaddeus, his name literally means mama's boy. Happy Mother's Day, right? We know very little about this man except that he was probably a mama's boy, right? How does that make us feel? Jesus can take James the less, the one who's less than anyone else and doesn't have a a high prestigious position in the world. He can take Thaddeus, who's known as the mama's boy, and he can make them disciples as well. And then Simon the Zealot, amazing. A, a, A zealot could serve together with a tax collector. Do you understand that these people are fighting on opposite ends of the spectrum? 
This is, this is crazy. This is crazy thinking. A zealot was an ancient terrorist, a faction headed by Judas of Galilee in the days of the enrollment in Luke chapter 2 actually opposed and threatened taxation by death when Quirinius was the governor. We read that in Luke chapter 2. These men were known to take up the sword often to create confusion and chaos. Think May Day protesting that we saw just a few days ago. He was directly opposed to tax collectors. And Jesus takes these two guys, the terrorist and the tax collector, working for two opposite ends of the spectrum and makes them his disciples. Do I even need to mention Judas Iscariot? Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. And and Jesus' sovereign grace and knowledge, I think he probably knew it ahead of time. I think he knew that he was going to be betrayed by this man who eventually would actually sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. And here in this moment, we learn that Judas had more excitement about money and possessions than about his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the message I just gave to you, these 12 men, should give you so much hope. It really should. It should want you, it should inspire you to take that next step. To say, oh yeah, if these guys can make, they're not spiritual elitists. These people aren't amazing. I always thought they were like amazing. And we, we hear stories later on. Yes, because they became amazing. Why? Because Jesus made them his disciples. See, the the thing is that that you might think today that I have to get my life together. I have to be a person that is totally, you know, 100% sold out before I can be a follower of Jesus. And if we learn anything about the disciples, is that discipleship happens as a process. It, it means that you can be one way now. You can take that next step with Jesus, that risk, and say, yes, I, I want to follow you. I want to I respond to your call, and then I want to see what you're going to make of my life. I have my own unique personality and things. I am type A, I, you know, whatever it is. I, I don't know what that looks like. I am kind of a guy that speaks too quick, and I wish I could bring my words back, but I do that. I, I blow up. I, 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 moms, I yell at my kids all the time, and I can't stop yelling at my kids. I'm like the mom of Boandries or something like that. But the thing is, like, there's hope for you. There's hope for you. There's hope for me. And that's the calling of a disciple. Jesus, who can make us into the people that follow him. Right after Jesus calls his disciples, a really interesting thing happens. Mark is going to describe the context of their calling as one of opposition. There's an open attempt to destroy Jesus, and not only his own family doesn't even understand him in this thing. A really interesting thing happens. We would read Mark 3, 20 through 35 if we have time, but we don't have the time today. Let me just explain it to you what happens. It's another one of these famous Mark and sandwiches. I mentioned the Mark and sandwich last week. And, and what happens in this is, it, is there's a story by the author, Mark, who's trying to start to tell us something, and then he breaks off into another story, and then he picks up the story again at the very end, and it's to prove a point. And the point is, I think, going back to the calling of the disciples and what it means to be a person who follows Jesus. Because in Mark 3, 20 through 21, Jesus' family actually comes to seize him. To, the, the word there is actually to, to take him away by force. They want to lock him up because they think the guy has gone mad, right? Because he's calling, first of all, he's calling these crazy people to him, to surround him. They're going to be his best friends. He's going to send them out to preach the gospel and to cast out demons. And not only that, he's just casting out demons. How weird is that, right? So his families are going, we need to go get that guy. Get him away. And then something interesting happens in Mark 3, verses 22 through 30. These scribes, the Pharisees, the keepers of the law go and and they try to tell Jesus that he is actually um, of the devil. He says, you're, you're evil is what these scribes say. And, and Jesus has a moment here where he says to them, you know, what, what makes me evil? If I was casting out demons by the power of Satan, wouldn't I be dividing my own self? What makes me evil in that way? And then there's this interesting moment where, where Jesus is confronted or confronting them with this idea that if, if you don't believe in me, if you don't put your faith in me, then there is a sin that will not be forgiven. It's this really crazy idea, which we don't have time to get into today. You could actually discuss this in your generosity groups, which is a great question on our generosity group list of questions this week. But the point of it is this. If you reject the authority, the power, the calling of Jesus on your life, that, that is damnable. That is the worst news ever. And then at the very end again in Mark 3, 31 through 35, the camera returns once again to Jesus' mother and brothers who arrive and call back to Jesus again. And and Jesus says these crazy words, and I I will just read these. He says at the very end of this time, um, who are my mother and brothers? 
while this may seem like a harsh question in some sort, it's not meant to be. Jesus' aim is to not destroy the family, and, and he says these next words, which I think really, really tie up this message today. He says, For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother, in Mark 3, verses 34 through 35. Now, I think why this ties it up is because this whole thing becomes a battle of wills. This whole thing becomes like, who are you going to follow? Are you going to follow yourself, your own desires, your own, um, your own personality? Or are you going to respond to the call of Jesus and say, yes, I want to be made in the disciple that you want to call me to be? Or are you going to continue to live your own way? Because what Jesus is going to say here is if, if you want to follow the will of God to be his family, you have to accept that calling. You have to say, yes, I trust you. I put my faith in you, and I want to be that next level follower, if you will. I think these two stories and these really three stories in this make this similar point. It's that this, Jesus' crowds around him and even his family and the teachers of the law, none of them got it. None of them understood who Jesus was. None of them took the chance on Jesus. But then the ordinary random people, the 12 disciples who didn't have a lot to maybe offer the world, the people who didn't feel like they were, they were the best of society, the most influential, they're the ones who said yes. They're the ones who followed Jesus. They're the ones who said it's his desires, not my own. You know, as I close today, I'll... I want to look at this because I want to go back to relationship. I want to couch this once again. What, what is the process of taking the risk to follow Jesus? Let me couch this once again in my story of Kelly and I. When Kelly and I were married, finally, I, I learned something about myself, and that is I'm extremely selfish as a person. You learn that in your first couple years of marriage, and then when you have kids, you find out you're uber, uber selfish as well, and you really desire things for yourself. See, what happened is our dating relationship looked a little bit like this. I, when I was single, I had all my own desires. I could do my own thing, and I never had to think about anyone else. But as we started dating, my desires and Kelly's desires started to get mixed up a little bit. And as we got closer and closer, my desires started to lessen, and I started to think about her more and more. Until finally we got married, married, the hope was that her desires were primacy in my life, that I cared for her and what she wanted more than anything else. Similar to her, when we understand the calling of Jesus, we recognize the authority that she, he should have in all the areas of our lives. I pulled an illustration from Jan Hedinga's book, Follow Me, this week to close us. And it's this idea of, what are your desires? What are they? See, I think our hearts have desires. You have an agenda for your life, if you will. You're, you have something in there that you say, this is what I want to do, and, and this is my thing. But when you start to meet Jesus, you, you realize that, that your agenda is starting to get a little smaller and you start to add on God's agenda to that a little bit. That it's not just about you anymore, but it's about not only your agenda, but God's agenda as well. As you get to know him more and more, you find out your agenda and God's agenda start to be about the same. And as you carry this on, suddenly God's agenda gets bigger and bigger and bigger until finally you realize, oh, it's, it's about God's agenda. My agenda should be small, God's agenda should be the biggest part of my heart. See, the thing is, when he says, who is my mother and brother? Who are the people who are going to follow me? It's people who do this. It's people who take this moment and say, I, I'm going to not make this life about me anymore. I'm going to work as hard as I can to build my heart to say yes to him, to trust that he's going to make me into the disciple that he wants me to be. Eugene, Eugene Peterson talks about this as the prayer of unselfing yourself. I think is beautiful. Unself ourselves. How do you be a disciple today? You unself yourself. See, I think when we get back to the disciples once again, we see Peter at really the end of the end of Jesus' life who denied him, who said, I, I don't I don't know that guy anymore. And man, he put his foot in his mouth and he hadn't made it all the way. He was doing his best to figure it out. But then we turn the page into Acts chapter one and two. And here Peter is the spokesperson for the gospel. He's the man who speaks about who Jesus is and what he's done. And he tells the people there is something amazing in Acts 2, verses 38 through 40. And you, don't have, you can just read in the screens behind me with, you, with me if you want to, where Peter is the man who said yes to Jesus and finally got it to the other people and said, uh, here in verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
For this promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. This is your calling today. Your goal is to receive the forgiveness of Jesus. There, you're, you're, my hope for you today is to hear the calling of Jesus, to turn to him, to trust in him, to put your faith in him, to say, I want to repent of my sins and my own agenda and make his agenda bigger in my life so that finally it's not about what I want anymore, but it's about what he wants. So that you're not perfect now, I'm not perfect now, we're in process and we're seeing God build us so that by the time that we get to the end of our lives, maybe we are people that are like the disciples that are calling out to other people, will you receive the grace of Jesus? Will you fall upon the cross and experience that great gift that Jesus offered us through his life and through his death and resurrection? So your job today is to respond. You can repent and be baptized today. We have a chance today to respond. We're going to sing a few songs this morning. And I would encourage you to think about your own lives. Where are you having your own agenda? Where do you see your downfall, your, your, your insecurities? Your, your, you're thinking, I have excuses. I, I'm not there where I need to be. And I think the calling of Jesus for your life this morning would be, you can be. I want to make you into my disciple. And that process is doing my will and making my desires, your desires, smaller and God's desires bigger. The start of that is to come to the cross this morning. As we sing some songs about the Lord, about his cross, about, about his life and forgiveness and love that he offers us, I would encourage you to come to Jesus and repent of your sins and to say yes to him and say, I want to start this relationship. I want to take that risk, that next step. You took a huge risk on me and I want to now respond to you. And so we're going to sing some songs. Sing with us. You can pray during this time as well. We'll have a chance just to, you can be quiet. You don't have to sing the songs if you don't want to. You can just sit there quietly and pray. Maybe ask the Lord to draw you near to him so that you can experience his grace and his love and his forgiveness and, and that calling that you have on your life. And you can as well come up at any time on the, during the next songs and receive communion. There's communion baskets on each table and you're welcome to come up and take the bread and dip in the cup and receive that as a way to say, yeah, I'm, I'm in. I, I want to do this. I want to take that risk. You took it on me, so I want to follow you now. I want to repent of my sins and, and chase you now. There's a gluten-free option on this table over, over here if you're gluten-free. There's offering baskets up here as well. And we're grateful for your gifts. You can come at any time during the next songs and give and, and use that as, a, as an act of worship to the Lord, and we're thankful for all the things that you've done. But most of all, would you respond? To, there's even one more idea today. Maybe the next step for you is to make your agenda smaller and God's bigger is to take that next step of baptism to say, I want to I do that. I, I want to now follow Jesus the way he's calling me to. I, I know I'm not perfect and like the disciples. I know he's going to make me into who the, he wants me to be, the person he wants me to be. That would be my encouragement to you today. Let's pray about these things as we turn to worship and experience Jesus' grace and goodness for our lives. Lord, I'm thankful for you. Lord, I'm thankful that you, that you tell us that you make us your disciples. Lord, I'm thankful that you want to build us into the people that you want us to be. And part of that is just denying ourselves to say, my, my desires aren't as important as yours anymore. And, and Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that. God, these, these pictures in Mark 3 are important when we see at the end that, that whoever does the will, my will is my mother and brothers and, and sisters, not those people who just look like they're following Jesus, not those people that, that aren't taking the next steps, but rather those who are saying, yes, I want to follow you with everything I have. So Lord, would you help us respond to you in that way today? Lord, I pray as we receive communion, we receive your forgiveness and your grace. I pray that we repent of our sins, of our selfishness and brokenness, and we turn to you with expectation that you can lead us and you can guide us. I'm thankful for all these things. We pray now that we'd respond to you in faith, in Jesus' great name. Amen.